Hey everyone, welcome back to Real Analysis 1. This will be part B of Lecture 1. So we had just finished discussing some of the prerequisites uh, with regards to set theory, and now we want to move into some of the prerequisites for functions, right? And so uh, we've seen functions obviously in many, many places. If you're taking a real analysis, you've almost certainly taken calculus where functions obviously play a central role. Um, and so in most places, we tend to think of a function as a rule. We tend to think of a function as a rule that assigns an element that assigns an element from a set A to a set B, that assigns an element from a set A to an element in a set B, right? So this is the common definition that you're probably used to seeing, right? However, I mean, so it's not that there's anything wrong with that definition necessarily, but we're going to need a bit more precision um, and we're going to have to have something a little less vague uh, for our purposes in this course. And so we want to kind of start fresh with a new definition of a function um, that is a bit more rigorous and a bit more uh, set theory based. So a little bit more set theoretic, right? And so here's our here's going to this is going to be the fun the definition of a function that we're going to work with for this course. So we're going to let a and b be any two sets. We'll let A and B be any two sets. Then a function from A into B is going to be defined as a subset of A cross B, the Cartesian product of A and B. So it's a subset of A cross B with a certain property. So with the property. So with the property that each x in A, right? so everything in the set A, is the first component of exactly one ordered pair in the function subset. So each x in A is the first component of exactly one ordered pair x, y, in f, okay? All right, so that's the, that's the basic definition. So it's going to be the, so basically a function is a subset f of the Cartesian product of a and b, okay? With this particular property that each x in a is the first component of exactly one ordered pair in this subset. Okay, so if we were to if we were to write this more in symbols, right, so in more symbolic right, mathematical notation, we might say that for all x in A, there exists a y in B such that x comma y is in the function subset. And Right, and if x comma y and x comma y prime are in F, then y is equal to y prime in the same element. Right, so the key thing here is that it's a subset of the Cartesian product of A and B, and that every x in A maps to precisely one y in B. Okay. All right, so this is a definition that I mean, I, I'm sure you can see like, okay, all of the, the normal sort of boxes that you would need to check uh, to determine if something's a function are, are checked here indeed. Um, and it's also obviously rooted more in set theory in the sense that A and B are thought of as sets 
and you've got this Cartesian product, which is basically this uh, ordered pair built from A and B, right? And then the function is thought of as a subset of A cross B. Okay. Now, in this in this scheme here, uh, we've got this set A. A is called the domain of F, right? So A is the domain, and B is called the codomain of F, right? So you've got the domain and the codomain, uh, A and B. Now within the codomain, there's a subset called the range. Within B, there is a subset called the range of f. Okay, so the range of f, what is that? Well, we all kind of know what that is, but let's write it out here. So the range of f is going to be all of the y in b, such that x comma y is in the function subset. And of course, for some x in a. All right, so this is the idea of the range. All right, we've certainly seen this before, right? So I've got my set A and I've got my set B right now. Here I've got some element X and it's going to map over into B, right? And inside of B I'm going to I can call it F of X if I want. Now, not everything in the codomain is going to be mapped to necessarily. Right, and hence the subset, which we call the range of F. Okay, so that's the idea. That's the definition of a function. Uh, that's the definition we'll need and use for analysis. All right, let's talk a little bit more about this construct. Um, and let's talk about it from maybe the standpoint of graphs of functions right so we can uh, let's draw a little picture here okay so let's say I've got my set a which would be like this interval here for example and then let's say I've got my set B which would be this interval okay and then let's say that my function starts here and it's say it ends over here. So it kind of does whatever it does in between those two points. Okay. Now notice that the codomain is this, right? And the domain is this. Now the range is actually going to be right here, isn't it? So this is the range of f. So notice that a everything in a is part of the function, it's the domain, uh, but everything in b is not necessarily in the range, right? So you've got, for example, l items up here are not mapped to by the function, as well as items down here. These are not mapped to, right? But in between these lines, this is the range, so everything in here is mapped to. So this set, this piece here is not in the range of the function. Okay. So here B is the called the codomain, A is the domain, and then within B there's a subset called the range. Okay. All right. So again, let's um, so like the previous like part A of the lecture, there's going to be a little, this will be a conversational sort of section. So let's talk through some of the um, conventions of functions. Uh, think through some of the common things that we're used to saying about functions, some of the terminology. So if x, y is in the function, then we call y Right, namely the second component of this ordered pair, we call y the value of f at x. 
right? And there's different ways to notate this. We would very often use this notation, y equals f of x, to denote the value of f at x. In this class, we'll also use notation like this, f takes x to y. Right? We might use this kind of notation to indicate that x maps to y uh, in this function. Right, And then kind of based on this idea, we'll also use this notation to denote a function. f is a function from a to b. We might write it like this. So we might use this to notate. So this would denote that f is a function from a into b. Okay. Now, what we'll be mostly focused on here are what are called real value functions, where the codomain is the real numbers. So when you see notation like this, that means we're talking about f. So this indicates that f is a real valued function, right? Meaning that it maps to a real number. Okay. Now, I think one of the things that's most important about the definition, well, certainly one of the most important things is this just we have to be very careful that while we, we do we say that f is a subset of a cross b uh, it's important to note that f is not just any subset of a cross b so f in a cross b is not just any subset of a cross b the key, the key phrase here is that each x in A is the first component of exactly one uh, ordered pair exactly one ordered pair. Now remember this is, you know, in algebra, in college algebra, or even in uh, calculus, when we talk about a function, we talk about the vertical line test. This is the set theoretic uh, analog to the vertical line test. Okay, and so this idea that x has to map to one and only one element, right? So like the way we're used to thinking about it is this is not a function, right? Because here's x and it would fail the vertical line test. Well, what that really means is that x would map to y1 and it would also map to y2, where y1 is not equal to y2, right? And so when we say that if xy and x comma y prime are both in the function, then y is equal to y prime. What that means is that f must pass the vertical line test. Okay, And so let's take a look at a couple of examples just to make sure we're really clear on this point. It's very important to have a good, good understanding of this idea of the vertical line test from the, from the standpoint of, of sets. Okay, so let's let a equal the simple set negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and 1. And let's let b equal the integers. Okay, and so let's let's write out a function in terms of uh, sets. Okay, so let's say we have negative 3 comma 2, negative 2 comma negative 2, and negative 1, 4, 0 comma negative 6 and 1 comma 4. Okay, so in this example, negative 3 goes to 2, negative 2 goes to negative 2, negative 1 goes to 4, 0 goes to negative 6, and 1 goes to 4. Right, so this is a function. Right, it has all of the qualities of a function. It's it's a subset of a cross b, 
and every element in A maps to precisely one element in B. Okay, so no problem here. Now let's replace F with a different uh, function or different subset of A cross B and let's call it G and let's say G is negative 3 comma 2, negative 2 comma 4, negative 2 comma 1, negative 1 comma 4, 0 comma 5, and 1 comma 1. Okay, so in this case we've got negative 3 mapping to 2, we've got negative 2 mapping to 4, we've got negative 2 also mapping to 1, we've got negative 1 mapping, well mapping to 4, actually comes up here doesn't it? And then we've got 0 mapping to 5, and we've got 1 mapping to 1. Okay, so, so, so this one is a little more, it's a little busier, a little more uh, all over the place. Now, g is not a function, and it's not a function because negative 2 maps to 4, and it maps to 1. So we would say that this function g does not pass the vertical line test because in this scenario you would have negative 2 here mapping to 1 and mapping to 4. Right? And so that would mean it would fail the vertical line test. Okay. Now, all the other business here, like negative 2 going to 4 and negative 1 also going to 4, that's not a problem, right? It's okay if, if uh, distinct elements from the domain map to the same element in the range, that's okay. The problem is when the same, when a, an element in the domain maps the two distinct elements in the range, that's not going to work out. Okay, very good. Let's take a look at another example here, functions. Let's let a equal b, uh, and both of them be the real numbers. And let's let h be defined as h is equal to the set of x, y in, obviously, r cross r, such that y is equal to x squared plus 2. Okay, so uh, this is, you know, in our usual way of thinking about this, this is just the function h of x equals x squared plus 2. That would be how we would describe it if we were to use a like, typical function notation. Now in this case, the domain of h is the real numbers, right? You can stick any real number into this function. Uh, any, any real number can be squared, right? And add, you can add 2 to any real number. Now, what's the range here? Well, we know what this function looks like if we were to plot it, right? It's, it's a, it would look like this, wouldn't it? Right, where this is 1 and that's 2 on the y-axis. Right, and so basically the range is everything above the value of y equals 2. So the range of h is equal to the set of y in the real numbers such that y is greater than or equal to 2. So anything below y equals 2 is never going to be uh, is never going to be a Y, a y component of this subset of r cross r. Right? So everything down here is not going to be included in the function subset. All right, very good. Very, very good. Okay, so let's kind of dig out some more definitions, things that we've probably heard of in the past that, again, we want to put on firm footing from the standpoint of set theory and also just dig out of our out of the archive of our of our minds here a little bit. So let's let f be a function from a into b 
then if E is a subset of A, right? If E is a subset of A, then F, then E evaluated under F is called the image of E under F. And it is defined by, so f of e is equal to f of x, such that x obviously is in e. All right, so basically, if e is a subset of the domain, then we can isolate subsets of the domain and talk about the, the image of that subset under f. Okay. Right, and sort of a similar a related concept. If H is in B, oops, if H is a subset of B, we'll say the inverse image, the inverse image of H. Or I guess that's the what we're defining the inverse image of H, uh, and we would and we would denote it by f inverse of h uh, is defined by let's say f inverse of h is equal to all of the x in a such that f of x is in h okay all right so here we we start with a subset of the domain Right, and we talk about the image of that subset under F. Here we talk about a subset of the codomain, right? Really, a subset of the range, and we're talking about a all. We talk about the inverse image of that subset of the domain of the range, right? So here, F inverse H is a subset of the domain. Right, so just to kind of put those both in context here a little bit, let's summarize that idea. So for E in A, the domain, F of E denotes a subset of B. Right, so if I start with a set E, which is a subset of the domain, then F of E is a subset of the range. And for H in B, so H is a subset of the range, then F inverse of H is a subset of A. So here we're talking about the range. Here we're talking about the domain. So very important. I mean, I know this can, you're, this can kind of tie your head up a little bit, but you just have to be very clear what we're talking, where each set is a subset. So E is a subset of the domain, then the image of E under F is a subset of the range. If H is a subset of the range, then the inverse image of H is a subset of the domain. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's see an example with this, with these sets. Let's let A equal uh, the set we used before. So negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1. And let's let B equal the integers. And well, let's say, and let's let F be a function from A to the integers. B, well. And let's let defined by f is equal to this set. So negative 3, 2, negative 2, negative 2, negative 1, 4, 0, negative 6, and 1, 4. Okay, All right, so this is indeed a function. And so then let's let e equal this subset of a we'll let it be negative one zero and one right this is a subset of a okay so then what is f of e what's the image 
of E under F. So the image of E under F is F of E. And that's going to basically be F of negative 1, F of 0, and F of 1. All right, And we know that as F of negative 1 is 4, F of 0 is negative 6, and F of 1 is also 4. So there it is. Right, so this, this is a subset of B. Right, this is a subset of the range. Okay. And perfect. So then if, let's do the reverse thing now. So if H is equal to, we'll say, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, Right? So this is obviously a subset of B. Right? Then what is the inverse image of H? What is the inverse image of H? So F inverse of H is equal to all of the things in A that map to these elements, right? So we would say, in, in notation, it would be all of the x in A such that f of x is in H, right? And so which things map into, into H here? So if we just look up here at the function, right, so is 0 map to? No, 0 is not map to. Is 1 map to? No, 1 is not map to. Is 2 map to? Yes. So negative 3 maps the 2. So negative 3 is in F inverse H. What about 3? Is 3 map to? Uh, no, 3 is not map to. What about 4? Does anything map to 4? Yes, negative 1 maps to 4 and 1 also maps to 4. So negative 1 and 1 are in here as well. So these are the three elements in the inverse image of H. Now notice some of these don't get mapped to, like that one doesn't get mapped to, one doesn't get mapped to, two doesn't, two gets mapped to, three doesn't get mapped to, right? So really only these two are even, are in, are part of the range. The rest of these are in the codomain, but they're, they're not in the range. So note, zero, one, and three are in B, but not in the range of F. All right, notice that. They can still be in H, though, right? They're a subset of the codomain, but they're not a subset of the range. They're not in the range, sorry. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we would say the inverse image of H would be these three elements here. Okay. Now, we can also use the we can also use the the notation of you know basically saying what's the inverse image of a particular element. So we might say what's the inverse image of four, right? So just uh, that would be the what's the inverse image of four, and so f inverse of four is going to be everything in the domain that maps to 4. And so we can look up here and see that that's negative 1 and positive 1. Okay. <clears throat> right. And so as we already said, you know, we want to make sure to emphasize this note. Uh, x comma 0 is not in F. Right. So here we were trying to look for something that maps to 0. x comma 0 is not in F for any x in A, right? And so we would say, we would say that the inverse image of zero is equal to the empty set, right? Zero's in the codomain, but 
it's not part of the range. And so the inverse image of anything that's not in the range of f is the empty set. So I guess we could write that down. The inverse image of anything that is not in the range of f uh, is the empty set. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. Okay. Let's take another. Let's take a look at another example. Let's let. Let's let h be the function defined by h of x equals 2x plus 3. Okay, and let's talk this one through. So what is the domain of h? The domain of h is obviously all real numbers, right? Any real number can be plugged into this expression, not a problem. Okay. Um, so let's think of a subset here of the real numbers. So let's let e so let's let E equal the set of X in the real numbers such that negative one is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to two. Okay, and so what is the inverse image? Or sorry, sorry, E in this case is a, is a subset of the domain. So what is the image of E under H? What is the image of E under H? Okay, so H of E is equal to, well, I mean, in, just in set notation, we would say it's equal to all of the 2x plus 3s such that negative 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 2. Right, and so we another way to write this, right, because this isn't, I mean, it'd, it'd be more helpful for me to write this in terms of the y's in the codomain. So this would also be equal to the set of all y in R, such that 1 is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 7. And where did this come from? Well, what we, I mean, just looking at this function, we know that it's a straight line. And so what we need to do is we need to translate the lower and upper bounds of this subset E, which is an interval, right, an interval, we need to translate the lower and upper bounds uh, into the range, right? So for example, H of negative one, the lower bound of the domain is equal to two times negative one plus three, which is one, and H of two, which is the upper bound of the subset in the domain, is equal to two times two plus three, which is seven, okay? And so this is going to, uh, this would translate over into the range, right? And so the image of E under H is going to be the set of all Y's in R, and now we're talking the codomain, such that Y is between 1 and 7. Everything in there will be mapped to by the elements in, in, in E, right? So that's where E is going to map to, all of those Y values. All right. Okay, so that's a, a great example. That's a great example. Okay, now in this case, we also have an inverse set here, don't we? Okay, for the set E, we also have. Right, what do we have? We also have that h inverse of e is equal to the set of x in R such that 2x plus 3 is in E. All right, and this of course is going to be equal to the set of x such that negative 2 
is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to negative 1 half. And where did that come from? Right. So note, in this case, y equals 2x plus 3. It's going to imply that you can find the inverse function here real easily, can't you? It's going to imply that 2x equals y minus 3, and also that x is equal to 1 half y minus 3 halves. And so we could plug the endpoints into this inverse function, negative 1 and 2, and we would get x equals 1 half negative 1 minus 3 halves, which is negative 4 over 2, which is negative 2. And here we would get x equals 1 half times 2 minus 3 halves, which would be uh, negative 1 half. All right, and so that's where that piece came, comes from. Okay. All right, very good. So these are good examples. Just uh, play with other examples like this. Think of, start with simple functions, right? Like, like simple line functions like this. And try to think about all of these different scenarios in terms of these kinds of simple functions. And, and kind of write out what, what is the image of these functions, what's the pre-image of these functions, etc. All right, now what we want to do is we want to kind of jump into some, some theorems that are analogous to some of the theorems we saw earlier when we were looking at uh, De Morgan's laws and... Um, different set, some of the earlier set theory uh, theorems. So this one is an important one. We're going to let f be a function from a into b. Now if a1 and a2 are subsets of a, then two things. First, the image of a1 or a2, the union of those, a1 or a2, the image of a1 or a2 is equal to the image of a1 or the image of a2. All right, so here we're talking about the union. So if I have two subsets in the domain, the image of the union of those two subsets is equal to the image of the first unioned with the image of the second. Okay, so that's the first one, and we'll prove these. The second one says that the image of the intersection, A1 and A2, in this case is a subset of the image of A1 and the image of A2. So in the first case, when we're talking about the image of a union of two subsets, we got equality. In the second case, when we talk about the image of an intersection of two sets, we don't get equality. We get that, that the image of that intersection is a subset of the image of the intersection of the two images. Okay, and so we're gonna we're gonna prove this. Uh, we'll we'll prove one, and then we'll do an example for two to show why indeed you don't have uh, why you don't get equality there. So let's prove one. We'll prove the first one. So uh, to do to show this, we basically have to show that this that the image of a one or a two is a subset of the image of A1 or the image of A2, and then the reverse as well. We have to show that the image of A1 or the image of A2 is also a subset of the image of A1 or A2. Right. So let's start with the one direction. All right. So we'll let x. Well, no, actually, we need to start with y's here in this case. Right. So we're going to let y be in the image of A1 or A2 then what we could say is that y is equal to f of x for some x in a1, well, in a1 or a2, right? Okay. Okay. So y, so if y is in the image of a1 or a2, then y is equal to f of x for some x in a1 or a2. That's all that means. Okay, and so then 
x is in a1 or x is in a2, right? And so let's let x be in a1. We'll let x be in a1. We'll start with that, right? Let x be in a1. Then y is equal to f of x, which is in f of a1, right? Um, if we let x be in a2, then y is equal to f of x, which is in f of a2. All right, so one of these is true, right? And so either way, therefore, y must be in f of a1 or f of a2. It's got to be in one of the two, right? And that gets us the first direction. So that means that f of a1 or a2 is a subset of f of a1 or f of a2. Okay, so that's the one direction. Now what about the other direction? Well, the other direction is actually simpler, right? Because, I mean, so cl clearly the reverse holds also because, so the reverse holds also because why? Well, because f of a1 and f of a2 are, they're both obviously subsets of f of a1 or a2. Right? I guess you can take that apart and see how completely obvious that is, but that is indeed true, right? So therefore, f of, oops, f of a1 or f of a2 is a subset of f of a1 or a2, right? Right, and so the two directions together, right? So basically this piece here, which we'll call one, and this piece here, which we'll call two. So one and two together imply that the sets are equal. Right? And that's basically the proof. Okay. Now you may think that this was a little too hand wavy, but make sure just take that apart and you you can easily show that. I think that uh, it's not too hand wavy that indeed it's enough to just kind of say well, this is obviously true. <laughs> but you may disagree. And if that's the case, you can take this one apart a little further. All right. Now, regarding the second one, regarding that second item, right? Let's uh, let's do an example. Uh, let's do an example to see how equality may not hold, uh, as we saw in part two of the theorem. So let's let g of x equal x squared, right? Then let's say that the domain of g is the integers. And let's say that a1 is equal to uh, all of the integers starting with 0 and going negative. So 0, negative 1, negative 2. You know, I think I want to write that the other direction just so it's clearer. So a1 will say is dot, 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 negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and 0. All right, so it's all of the integers going from 0 down. And then let's say that a2 is equal to all of the integers starting at 0 and going up. Okay. Now, in this case, f of a1 is actually equal to f of a2, right? That's going to be clear, right? Because 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1, negative 1 squared is also 1, right? So these are the same, these are the same, those are the same, those are the same, they all map, right? So in this case, f of a1 is equal to f of a2, which is 0, 1, right? And just and all the squares, basically, 4, 9, 16, and so on, right? 
right? So it's all the squares. Uh, but notice that the intersection of a1 and a2 is just the singleton 0, right? The singleton 0, 0 is the only element in the intersection of a1, right? And so f of a1 and a2, well, that's just equal to basically the image of just the set 0, right, which is just 0. And this is obviously not equal to f of a1 and f of a2, right? Because f of a1 and a2 is all the same. f of a1 and f of a2 are the same. It's because f of a1 and f of a2 is everything, is all of the squares, 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, and so on. Right? And so this basically boils down to being able to say in this example that 0, the set of elements just equaling 0, is not equal to the set of all the squares. This is f of a1 and a2. This is f of a1 and f of a2. Right? But this is a subset. Zero is in both. OK. All right. Awesome. So that is, um, that is a great example of you know, why we had that why we got this instead of equality, right? So it's a subset, it's not equal to. Okay, uh, let's take a look at another theorem which uh, deals with functions uh, and, and thinking about sets, the image of sets under functions. So let's let, let's let f be a function from a into B. Okay. Now if B, sorry, if B1 and B2 are subsets of B, if B1 and B2 are subsets of B, then we've actually got three parts to this one. So the inverse image of B1 or B2 is equal to the inverse image of b1 or the inverse image of b2. Okay. The second one says that the inverse image of b1 and b2 is equal to the inverse image of b1 and the inverse image of b2. All right. So here we get equality. That's B1, sorry. And the third one here says that uh, the inverse image of the relative complement of B1 and B, the relative complement of B1 and B, is equal to the relative complement of the inverse image of B1 in A. Okay. All right, very good. Let's prove part one of this. Okay, so as we're going through this, now notice this is not the subject matter of real analysis. This is the background. We're going to be using this type of these types of things in a lot of our arguments and our and our uh, examples, and in a lot of the proofs that we're developing. Right, and so I would expect, you know, if you're serious about taking this course, like you would, you know, I'll, we'll walk through the proof of one and then you should use the same approach and try to prove two and three. Make sure you understand why two and three are true as well. So let's prove part one of this and the others would be similar. Okay, so here we're trying to show that F inverse of B1 or B2 is equal to f inverse of b1 or 
f inverse of b2. Now, as you can imagine, it's probably going to go real similar to the previous theorem. But of course, it's backwards, right? Because now we're talking about the inverse image of a set of the range or set of the codomain. So let's let x be in the inverse image of b1 or b2. Okay, then by definition of the inverse image of a set, f of x, so then we would say f of x is in b1, or f of x is in b2, right? That's just the definition. Okay, so if x is in f inverse of b1 or b2, then by, de by definition of the inverse image of a set, f of x is in b1. Oh, I'm sorry, I wrote that wrong. f of x is in b1 or b2. Sorry about that. Yes. Okay. Right, and so then what I meant to write is the following. So I kind of skipped over this. I want to make sure that we do kind of step by step. So f of x is in b1 or f of x is in b2. That's what we mean to say. Now, again, you kind of take both separately and see what happens. So if f of x is in b1, then x equal, well, sorry, x is in f inverse of b1. And that's going to imply x is in f inverse of b1 or f inverse of b2, right? Right, so you get it that way. Uh, similarly, if f of x is in b2, then x is going to be in f of inverse b2, which implies the same thing. x is in f, of inver f inverse of b1 or f inverse of b2. Right here you get it here, and here you get it there. And so, basically, f inverse of b1 or b2 is a subset of f inverse b1 or f inverse b2. Okay, so you get that one first. And we'll call that one because we'll be referencing it later. Okay, let's flip over here and do the other direction. Okay, so now we'll go this other direction. Now to re to prove the reverse containment, right, we need to, we can note that B1 is a subset of B1 or B2. And also, B2 is a subset of B1 or B2, right? These two together imply that f inverse of b1 and f inverse of b2 are subsets are subsets of f inverse of b1 or b2 okay right and so that's all that's all we need that's it basically this is a, so b1 is a subset of b1 or b2 b2 is also a subset of b1 or b2 so that means the inverse image of b1 uh, and the inverse image of b2 are both subsets of the inverse image of b1 or b2 right and so that's all we need so the inverse image of b1 or b2 is a subset of the inverse image of b1 or the inverse image of b2 we'll call that two so then one and two one from the previous page and two imply that they're equal okay and so that's all we need to that's all we need to show perfect all right we're getting we're getting close folks we're getting close to the end of this one so we've talked about um, we've talked about what a function is which when we've we've been using this terminology of 
a function from A into B. And what we want to talk about next is what do we mean when we talk about an onto function and then corresponding you know, the concept, of, well, not necessarily, but a concept that frequently goes along with the idea of onto is the one-to-one -one function. So let's start with a one-to-one -one function, right? So a function f from a into b is said to be one-to-one said to be one to one if whenever x1 is not equal to x2 then f of x1 is not equal to f of x2 okay so another way to say this would be to say that whenever x1 comma y and x2 comma y are in f then x1 must equal x2 so another way to say it So if x1, y, and x2, comma y are in f, then x1 equals x2, right? So clearly the y is equal to y, right? And so if they're both in f, if you've got two elements, x1 and x2, that map to the same element, and the function's one to one, then the x1 and x2 must be the same thing, okay? Right? So we can also say when we have a one-to-one -one function, so if f is one-to-one, -one, then f inverse of y, the inverse image of y, the size of that set is equal to one for any y in the range of f. Right, so we saw previously examples where, you know, I think I think what we said was f inverse of four was equal to I think in our previous example one and negative one. Right, so this is obviously not a one-to-one -one function because this implies that one maps to four and negative one also maps to four. Right, so two elements map to the same element in the range, which is fine for a function, but it's therefore it's not a one-to-one -one function. So what we're saying is that a one-to-one -one function, the inverse image of any element in the range, uh, the set, the inverse image as a set, has cardinality one, right? There's only one element in the inverse image of any element in the range. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and let's talk about what an onto function is then. So if f is onto b, then we would say that f inverse of y is not empty for any y in b. Now here b is not the range, b is the codomain. Right, well b is the codomain of f. Okay. All right, now if b is on to, or sorry, if f is on to b, then there's actually uh, going to exist an, an inverse function, right? Right, so, uh, so you can think of it, so if f is on to b, then f inverse of y is not empty for any y and b, where b is the codomain of f. Now, we can say also that if f is one to one and on to, If f is one to one and on to b, then f inverse of y, 
consists of exactly one element x and a for all y and b. Right? And so that means that we have the inverse image is actually a function. Right? So then if we say g equal to y comma x, uh, sorry, let me write this correctly, g equal to y comma x in what's the, we, we need to talk about the Cartesian product again here, this would be b cross a such that f of x equals y. This is going to define a function from b to a. Okay. I think I want to write g of y equals x here. Apologies for that. Okay, so we've got a function. This is called the inverse function of f, right? Let's let's flush this out in a nice clean definition here. A nice clean definition of the inverse function. If f, we'll say if f is a one-to-one -one function, from a on to b, then let's let f inverse equal the set of y comma x in b cross a such that f of x equals y. Okay then f inverse is a function from b on to a called the inverse function of f called the inverse function of f okay so this is the inverse function all right so what's going on here all right, I've got A and I got B, right? So in this case, every X maps obviously to a Y in B. Now, every Y in B is mapped to, right? And so every Y in B is mapped to by F. And in fact, uh, every X maps to every Y in B and only one actually, right? So every X maps to precisely one Y and B, right? And every Y and B is mapped to by only one X. And so we have this reverse function that goes the opposite direction now as well. Okay, so we have this reverse function and this is the called the inverse function. All right, very good. All right, let's see an example here. Let's see an example of the inverse function. Let's let h of x equal 2x plus 3. Same, same, same example from previously. Then the domain of h is the real numbers. Now the function is going, I mean, it, the function is clearly one to one, right? And you can see if that's the case, right? Because how, do, what does the function look like? Well, it kind of goes like this, right? It cuts through, it's a straight line, right? So every element on the Y axis is mapped to exactly once, right? There's, it, there's no turning back, right? It's a monotone function, right? It's a function in this case, it's strictly increasing. So H is clearly one to one since every Y in the real numbers is mapped to exactly once. Right? It's also 
onto, right? H is also onto R, since every real number is going to be mapped to under H, right? There's every y, every number on the y-axis is going to be hit because this is going to strictly increase forever and strictly decrease in this direction forever, right? And so everything is going to get hit. And so what is the inverse function? The inverse function is, let's see, x. So we can think of it like this. You can derive it. y equals 2x plus 3 implies that y minus 3 equals 2x implies that x equals 1 half y minus 3 halves. Right, and you guys should write that like 1 half times y minus 3. So h inverse of y is equal to 1 half y minus 3. Okay, that's the inverse function. Right, and so again here we would say that the domain of h inverse is the real numbers. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, um, let's do another example. We're getting very close to the end here. I want to make sure that we touch everything. We just gotta. We have to be certain that. We at least have some of these concepts in our minds before we before we move forward. Okay, so let's let f of x equal x squared in this example. Now we know that f in this case is not one to one. All right, f in this case is not one to one. Since, I mean, we could come up with lots of examples, but here's an example. Since we could say f of negative 2 equals f of 2, both of them equal to 4. So you got two values in the domain that map to the same value in the range. So not 1 to 1. But if we were to limit the domain of f, if we limit the domain of f to, let's say, we want to say instead that the domain of f, and we'll denoted with the letter A, the set A. We're going to say that that's all the real numbers such that x is greater than or equal to 0. That's all the real numbers greater than or equal to 0. In this case, then, f becomes 1 to 1. And f becomes 1 to 1. Right, and so we can show that f is 1 to 1 right to see this and this is just a good example of how to show one to oneness to see this let's let x1 and x2 be an a right and so what we need to show then uh, and we'll say with x1 not equal to x2 and so in, in this case let's so let's suppose that one is less than the other so let's let x1 be less than x2 well, so what we need to show then is that if x1 and x2 are not equal, then they can't map to the same element ever, right? So if x1 is less than x2, then logically speaking, x1 squared will be less than x2 squared. Remember, we're talking about the function f of x equals x squared. Okay, and so if x1 is less than x2, then x1 squared is less than x2 squared. And obviously, uh, that implies that f of x1 is less than f of x2, right? And which is all we need to show, right? Because all we need to show is f of x1 is not equal to f of x2. Okay, so therefore, f is not 1 to 1. Or f is 1 to 1, sorry. Okay, now to see that f is also onto, well, it's not onto all of the real numbers, but we can show that f is onto b, where b is going to be equal to the set of all real numbers y, such that y is greater than or equal to 0. What we, what we would need to show is that for all y in b, so we wish to show 
for all y and b, uh, there's going to exist an x in a such that x squared equals y. Okay, now we know this is true. Right, we know this is obviously true. But it wouldn't be completely obvious how to rigorously show this. Right, we know this is true, but we cannot rigorously, I will say, show this without a very key piece of machinery from analysis, and that is something called the least upper bound property, which we will get to in the next lecture, actually. Right, so we're going to have to pause on this one, but I do encourage you to think about how you might show that, that this is true. Right. Think about how you might show that that's true. Um, and you'll see, I mean, you maybe won't see, but to rigorously demonstrate it, you do need something called the least upper bound property, which is the subject matter of the next section. Let's talk about what through one final concept here that we will need and that's going to be the composition of functions. So if we have two functions, if we have a function f from a to b and a function g from b to c, then the function g composed of f from a to c is defined by We would say g composed of f equals all of the ordered pairs x comma z in the Cartesian product a cross c such that z is equal to g of f of x. Right? So g composed of f is a function from a to c defined by blah 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 is called the composition. We call this the composition. It's the composition of G with F. And this is the composition function. Composition of functions. So basically taking a function and plugging it into another function. We've certainly seen this before. Um, but we need to review it. We need to make sure that we're clear on it. That it's at the forefront of our minds because we will be using it. So let's see an example here. Let's let f of x equal the square root of 1 plus x with the domain of f being basically all of the real numbers x such that x is greater than or equal to negative 1. And let's let g of x equal x squared with the domain of g, with the domain of g equal to real numbers in general. Okay. Then let's talk about how to compose these two functions. So then g composed of f of x. Now you may be more comfortable thinking about it, or notating it like this, g of f of x. I, indeed, I'm more comfortable notating it that way as well. right? But what is g of f of x? Well, it's equal to, on the outside, you've got the g function, which is x squared. And inside, you've got f of x, which is the square root of 1 plus x. Right? And so that, of course, simplifies because it's just the square root of 1 plus x all squared. So that's just 1 plus x, actually. Okay. Now, it's important to keep this concept straight. Now, we know that the function 1 plus x is defined for all real numbers. Right? So note, 1 plus x is defined all real numbers 
right? But because it, we're talking about the composition of functions, right? And in particular, f of x, remember up here, has a domain that has to be restricted in order to make f of real valued function, right? Because this is the square root of 1 plus x. So x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1 in order for f to be a real valued function. And so because of that, the domain of the composition of g with f, we have to restrict the domain as well. So 1 plus x may be defined for all real numbers, but g composed of f is uh, constrained by the domain of f. It sort of inherits the domain. So the domain of g composed of f, in this case, would be all of the real numbers x, such that x is greater than or equal to negative 1. Right. So basically, your interior function is going to constrain your exterior function in this case, and the composition of functions. What about the composition in the other direction? Like what if we do f composed of g instead? So f composed of g of x. Well, that's equal to f of g of x, which is equal to 1 plus x square root of that. That's the f function. And then inside that is g, uh, where g is just x squared. So this becomes x squared right now in this case the domain is all real numbers so the domain of f composed of g is actually equal to r right now it works in both ways so first of all we would say the domain of g which is you know g of x was just x squared so the domain of g was all real numbers so we don't have any constraint coming from the g function but then further, even when we do the when we um, when we do the composition, we see that we no longer have to constrain x because when we square x, it becomes a positive number. So we're never going to be taking the square root of a negative number, right? This in the inside here is one plus a positive number, always positive, right? So the domain is going to be all real numbers in this case. Okay. Very good. Um, one more example, and then we'll call it quits here. So one more example. Let's think about the function um, f of x equals 1 plus x, square root of 1 plus x. So think about, I mean, it's the one we were just talking about. So let's let f of x equal the square root of 1 plus x. Okay. The inverse function exists. The inverse function exists, um, and I'll let you, you can spend some time calculating what that is, but it's equal to f inverse of y equals y squared minus 1, right? Now, the domain of f inverse, in this case, is equal to the range of f. Okay, and what is this? What is the domain and the range here? The, in this case, the range is equal to all of the y real numbers such that y is greater than or equal to zero, right? Okay, then what can we say here, right? So if we've got f and we've got its inverse, okay, so then for x in the domain of f, for x in the domain of f, f inverse composed of f is equal to, of course, f inverse of f of x, which is equal to basically f of x squared minus 1. Right? In this case, it's equal to the square root of x minus 1 squared minus 1, right? And what is that? So here you would get what? You would get the square root of x minus 1 
all squared would just be x minus 1 and then minus 1. Sorry, this, this should be plus 1, my, my bad. And you would get x, right? Okay, and so this squares with what our intuition tells us. We, you know, we would we would think that f inverse of f of x should be just x, right? And it is indeed, it is right. And you can think about it in more rigorous terms. Uh, you can see that that is the case. Now, what about the other direction? What about f composed of f inverse of y? Well, that's equal to f of f inverse of y, which is equal to, in, in, in this case, it would be y squared minus 1 plus 1, all, you know, we'd have to take the square root of it. So basically, f is, this, remember, the square root of x plus 1, and f inverse of y is y squared minus 1. So just kind of composing those two, what do we get here? Well, we get we get the square root of y squared minus 1 plus 1. And we that, I mean, that is basically just the square root of y squared, which is y. Right, so here again, we see that f of f inverse of y is equal to y. Right, so we get both of those. Right, now, of course, this only works for one-to-one -one onto functions where you actually have an inverse. Right? But this obviously squares with our intuition about how inverses ought to be ought to work with one another, uh, how a function and its inverse when compo when you compose the two, how they ought to work together. Okay, all right, very good. I know it was a very long, very long section, but I think we'll end it there. So next time uh, in the next lecture, we'll talk. We'll kind of start. Um, well, we're I would say we are going to start our analysis material. Next time we'll talk about the all-important least upper bound property. And this is going to be a key property of the real numbers that we will use all the time. And then after that, we get in, after that lecture, we're going to get into the very, very interesting section uh, on countable and uncountable sets. In my opinion, this is one of the most interesting, this will be one of the most interesting lectures in all of your math career, in my, in my personal opinion. I just simply because I find uh, this, I just find that the concept of uncountable versus countable infinity to be very, very uh, compelling and interesting. All right, so anyways, we'll leave it there and I will talk to you all next time. Take care.